What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. Action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome and thank you for being with us today. We are here to talk about digital inclusion, which of course now is an absolute prerequisite for pretty much every other kind of inclusion, financial inclusion, inclusion in healthcare and education. And we're here to talk about a really big global collaborative project called the One Billion Lives Challenge, which has been put together by the Edison Alliance. And it has some really big goals to address the SDGs by getting a billion people um, access online um, by 2025. So we have an amazing panel of people here to talk about this, and I'd like to introduce them. Before I do that, I just want to say to all of you, we are all very looking forward to hearing your questions, and there will be plenty of time for you to, to ask questions to the panel. So please, throughout the panel, hit the chat button, and you can ask your questions, and I will pass them along to our panelists. So first today, we have um, Hans Vesberg, who is the chairman and CEO of Verizon um, Communications. And before that, he was the president and CEO of Ericsson, another multinational telecommunications company. We also have Ruth Perrette, who comes to us from Alphabet and Google, where she is Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. We have um, Badr Jafar, who is here from the UAE, and he is the CEO of Crescent Enterprises and Crescent Petroleum. And he also founded Pearl Initiative, which is a nonprofit committed to promoting corporate transparency um, in the Gulf region. And finally, we have Dr. Precious Maloya Matsepe, who is here from South Africa. She's the founder and CEO of the Investment Fund, the African Fashion Inter International. And she's also the founder and CEO of the Matsepe Foundation, which focuses on education and women's empowerment. Thank you all so much for being with us today. 
So Hans, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Um, can you tell us, give us an introduction um, to the Edison Alliance and to the, the One Billion Lives Challenge? And what was, what was it created to do and how is it going so far? <laughs> thank you, Catherine, and, and thank you for hosting this. Uh, so it, it's actually started many, many years ago. I think that many of us have seen the importance of digital inclusion to be part of our society. Uh, wherever you're born, wherever you come from, uh, you should have the same possibilities. And of course, digital inclusion is the 21st century's infrastructure. Mobility, broadband, and cloud is actually making uh, lives and, and uh, possibilities for anyone wherever they are. So actually, it started already some 2007 or eight or something when I learned about the Millennium Development Goals, start working with that, I saw the connectivity is so important. And of course, I was part of formulating the SDGs and some might remember that I was fighting hard for goal 18, that every, that we should have a universal connectivity for every citizen on this planet. Of course, it's 17 goals, so uh, that didn't really happen. But what happened was, of course, that we understood that in all 17 goals, the infrastructure behind it uh, uh, is, in many cases, mobility, broadband, and cloud to access all citizens of the world, being able to give them the services. Uh, however, we continue with that. And um, as the pandemic developed, we understood that reaching the SDGs is even harder right now with the economic downturn and, the, and, this, uh, uh, and this tough and uh, uh, pandemic that we had. So in a conversation with the World Economic Forum, uh, we agreed that we need to kick off a, a, a multicultural, multidisciplinary, multi-segment work to see that we are making this planet more inclusive because it's more important than ever to, to do a job, education, uh, financial inclusion, uh, healthcare, using the digital that we have. So we decided that in the beginning of the year to launch the Edison Alliance with uh, some four to five partners uh, from the public, private, leading companies from all around the world. Some are representing here, of course, Root is part of it, uh, but many others. But it's also the, the, the public sector, governments uh, uh, and NGOs, and of course, uh, organizations like the Broadband Commission, GSMA is part of it. The whole idea is, of course, not only doing advocacy, it's also the making commitments. And not only that, also sharing the best practices for everyone involved to see that. We are focusing mainly in the beginning on financial inclusion, inclusion healthcare, and education. And uh, today, as you rightfully said, our commitment from this Edison Alliance right now, which is the work together with WEF and all the partners and the 45, 45 champions we have, is to commit to improve 1 billion lives by increasing affordable digital access to healthcare, finance and education by 2025. And we have already kicked off, we have already given out uh, a lot of commitments, but we're far away from there to change the one billion lives. But clearly, as we know the world right now, I mean, uh, a vast majority of the world doesn't, are not connected, half of the world, 3.8 billion people doesn't have the co connectivity today. They have actually coverage in many cases, but they need affordable services, devices, and of course, in some cases, the technology literacy is too high. So it's a, it's a multidisciplinary work that works from uh, accessibility, affordability, and usability of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to have all these great champions from public and private sector to be part of this commitment that we launched today. And uh, our job is to make this uh, digital gap to be much smaller, having more people on Earth have the same opportunities, regardless where they're born, where they live, where they come from, they should have the same opportunity. Maybe it's not going to be a a hospital and a, and a school that I had five minutes from where I was brought up, it might be a virtual school and a virtual uh, healthcare, but they should have the same opportunity to compete and be part of our society. And that's what we are launching here today with the one billion, but the Edison Alliance that was formed in the beginning of the year. And we have much more to do until 2025, but I have to say I'm encouraged with all the support and all the uh, team that is working on this, including the World Economic Forum, uh, forum supporting this uh, enormously important project that we're emba embarking on. So that's a sort of the history of it, where we are today. And I'm uh, extremely fortunate to be the chairman of the Edison Alliance, but they, um, I'm relying on all the partners and the champions to do this and make this happen across the globe. 
So can you give us some examples of the kind, the types of commitments you're talking about? So, I mean, obviously there are financial commitments, but, but what else are, are you securing from companies and, and governments and, and what are you hoping to get partners to commit to? Yeah, I mean, I think that I have a couple of examples. I can talk about MasterCard. I mean, they will bring another 500 million people to the digital economy by 2025. Verizon, and my company, we're committing to invest $3 billion uh, across a five-year span uh, for, to make, for youth and small businesses and individuals in the need of, of connectivity. Uh, and the list goes on, including Universal Cape Town, uh, the Apollo hospitals from India, Qualcomm, of course, Ruth will talk about what Google is doing. So I think we all are rallying together, but it's also sharing, advocacy, talking to governments, where are the public and private starting and ending? Because So it's a lot of commitment. It's not only financial, it's also uh, where you're actually going to educate youth that we are doing and others are doing on the illiteracy of technology, uh, having... Uh, technology access to website, understanding how to read website, making it simpler to use. There's a lot of things. Sometimes we make it very simple talking the accessibility of the technology is the only thing, but it is affordability and it's usability. And I think all the champions that we're working with are trying to make that happen and especially focusing then on healthcare, education, and financial inclusion. There are many other areas as well, but we wanted to be narrowing down the scope from the beginning in order to see that we make a real impact on these. And that's the commitment of 1 billion people being part of it. Yeah, this certainly makes sense to me as, as the first three priorities. But that's a, a, a good segue to you, Ruth. Can you tell us about what Google is, is committing to doing? And I'm also curious in how you're thinking about how those commitments are aligning to the SDGs. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. It's um, a real privilege to be here. And I think it's such an important conversation. You know, if the pandemic did anything, it put a big spotlight on inequities in society. It amplified them, but they were not new. And to Hans's point, we've been focused on many of the solutions prior. And I think the critical nature of what we're talking about here today is we all need to come together because it's by working with one another, public sector, private sector, NGOs, that we can really focus and accelerate the delivery of these solutions. So just to pick up on two of the areas that Hans mentioned, first on digital inclusion and education. This has been a prime focus for us at Google for quite some time. Back in 2015, we launched a digital skills training program called Grow with Google. And initially we started with IT job training, IT support job training, one of the fastest growing areas for jobs. And our view was that we could take people with no experience and within three to six months, give them the training they needed to get the jobs of the future. And what we concluded was that this was so effective, we wanted to create a certificate so that there was something that was portable, that really documented what people had achieved. And then we recently have expanded our program. So it's not just IT support, but we also do project management, data analytics, user experience. So there are a number of different career paths. And again, with no pre-training, you can get these um, the, tr the training and the certificate within a short period of time. I think the most important part, and very much to Hans's opening comments, we need to work together. So we said, let's create a consortium. We now have over 130 companies who accept this certificate. And Hans, thank you for Verizon's leadership here, B of A's involved, Deloitte, and many others, Walmart. Um, and we're excited to invite anybody else in so that, again, we're building a, a community that accepts these types of digital skills training. And we've seen in practice the transformative nature it has. So super excited about it. Two examples for small businesses in the U.S., one in three small businesses said they would have failed in the pandemic if they didn't have digital skills. So this is the kind of training that we can provide and it's the backbone of economies globally. The second for individuals, I was in London a couple of weeks ago at one of our digital skills training programs. I was actually at Arsenal Football Club where there was a job program going on. And we brought together some people who had gone through our training program. And I'll never forget the last person um, who spoke. He came to us, Kabwe from, from uh, Zambia, had come to the UK, he was studying in the UK and he couldn't get a job at the end of it. And he actually said he gave up on the idea that he could get a job. And then he went in and went through the Grow with Google digital skills training program. And it was such a great way to end the day because he said he got a job, but he also got confidence that he had a role in the future. And I love this comment in the opening video, imagining the
the future. We need to let people see that they are part of the future. And that's exactly what he said in this session. So invite anybody who wants to join in this type of program and aligning with other digital skills programs that they have. The second area that's super important is on health. I mean, we've all been living through this. And one of the areas that's been so core to us at Google is making sure that we're amplifying high quality information so people know where to go. And that means really teaming up with the best in cloud World Health Organization and others and amplifying uh, their information. It also means doing everything that we can to help facilitate distribution of vaccines. So working with COVAX as an example. And again, these are examples where individually, yes, we're committed and we're doing a lot. And we find that as we team up public sector, private sector, NGOs, as Hans said is in your opening comments, we're going to have much, um, much bigger impact at a much more accelerated pace. And so we look forward to continuing to execute against this and seeing progress towards the billion goal. So I'm, I'm curious, I mean, we Hans mentioned at the beginning that that part of the problem is people who don't have access at, at all um, to the digital world. But a big problem is affordability, and that's true even in the most developed economies and, and even in the U.S. When you're thinking about some of this problem solving, how, how much are these solutions kind of portable around the world, and how much are you needing to think about things very tied to the places that you're trying to solve the problems? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think, you know, Fortunately, phones are quite ubiquitous and the ability to train people, what we're trying to do is make this as easy and portable as possible. And so um, the digital skills training program is an online program and uh, it's it's available, it's free. You can you know get online and, and learn it. And we're also providing support for those who go through a program and they need incremental incremental financial support because they're, they're working through how do you get a certificate. It is a key part of it, and I think that um, one of the things that we're really focused on is what is really plays to Google's strengths, and that is giving people the jobs and skills of the future. And so one of the things that we've done as we've evolved our program is we started with substantial training, millions of people trained around the globe. And then we said what we really want to look at is measure who the, the percentage of people who got a better job or higher pay as a result of it. So this is trying to open pathways to the future for them. And most certainly to your point, it's about making it as broadly available as possible. That's great. Um, okay, so um, Bader, this is all going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> so that's what, what I would like you to talk about is what are the, um, what are the innovative and sustainable methods of, of securing capital we can use to support all of this? Um, how do we deal with competition? How do we deal with, with getting the right money with the right patients um, for the right projects? So allow me to make an overarching uh, observation, which is that we mustn't get carried away with the narrative that digital empowerment is uh, somehow an end in itself, uh, addressing, of course, the, the global challenges that humanity and our habitat faces is, is the ultimate goal, right? So technology is a means uh, to that end, and technology in itself isn't the agent of change either. We, the um, connected people, uh, are the true agents uh, of change, and history will judge us uh, on whether we uh, use these tools for the collective betterment uh, of humanity uh, and, our, and our habitat uh, or uh, for the exacerbation of our own uh, flaws. Uh, I am uh, far less accomplished uh, than my fellow uh, panelists to opine on specific opportunities within the sector itself. But what I'd very much like to see is a strategy that, that's built um, around an overall purpose of equipping our youth predominantly, uh, particularly underrepresented uh, and underserved, uh, with the digital tools that they need uh, to be effective change makers. So empowering them uh, to be the, uh, the change that they want to see uh, in, in this world. And, and this statement of, of purpose or theory of change or whatever we choose to call it, uh, should help to guide all uh, stakeholders to come together towards a unified objective uh, of creating a digitally empowered uh, global community with, as has been said, inclusive access to all essential services, uh, financial, educational, um, medical, uh, and, and of course, entertainment, uh, and uh, with a heightened sense of awareness and sense of shared responsibility uh, to transcend uh, borders, both uh, physical uh, and uh, social um, in, uh, in aid of our um, uh, common uh, objectives and, and global goals. 
Uh, and of course, the opportunity, as again has been mentioned, is massive, right? As we know, uh, only half uh, of the global population uh, is estimated to be using the internet, leaving, as has mentioned, about 3.8 billion people uh, offline. Um, also, the global proportion of women using the internet is lower uh, compared to men, and the divide uh, is growing. Uh, in less developed countries, uh, less than a quarter of people are reported to have digitally relevant uh, skills. Uh, compared to uh, more than three quarters in developed countries. When it comes to big data, for example, Africa and Latin America account for less than 5% of the world data centers. Uh, so if we are to solve our global challenges um, and meet the SDGs in, in eight uh, or so years' time, we need to access all the human capital available uh, and uh, the creative minds and hearts uh, out there. Um, and, and, and we can only do that uh, with the pace that's required through digital uh, empowerment. On uh, investment models, um, today, I think the business case for connecting the unconnected, uh, aside from the moral uh, or social imperative, is really a no-brainer. I mean, an estimated 70% of new value created in the economy over the next decade will be based on digitally uh, enabled platforms. Uh, historically, I think governments have been the main financiers for digital infrastructure. However, uh, long-term uh, private capital in this space is uh, significantly on the rise. I mean, just taking India uh, as an example, uh, pre-1990s uh, uh, telecom infrastructure was funded solely by the government. But after the liberalization and privatization uh, incentives in the 90s, 85% um, of the subsequent spend on digital infrastructure has been by private players. Uh, what was, of course, key is, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and it, it relied on a conducive regulatory and commercial framework that enabled private capital uh, to enter and flourish. And today, with trillions of dollars of capital chasing yield uh, in a zero interest rate environment, uh, long-term stable uh, tariff-based investment opportunities like digital infrastructure uh, is super uh, compelling. So while there's always room, I think, for more creative investment models and tools, I think the more significant question to ask here is uh, perhaps twofold. What is holding back more private patient capital from plugging the gaps wherever they exist? And how can we accelerate the establishment uh, of compelling uh, and transparent uh, regulatory and investment frameworks to catalyze uh, more investment uh, in digital uh, infrastructure. How would you start to answer both of those questions? So what, what do you think the main thing holding, holding back that capital is and, and what's the most urgent um, solution that, that needs to be put into place to encourage it? So I'm no expert, but I, from a Middle East and North African standpoint, I think it's what I mentioned, which is that uh, enabling environment, that conducive regulatory environment, and also commercial frameworks to encourage those capital flows. I think another challenge that we face in the region is sometimes is, uh, government monopolies, businesses that are prim primarily owned by or majority owned by government, uh, who exclude uh, the private sector from engaging and perhaps investing in this uh, for one reason or another. So those are some some obvious, uh, I think, ways we can we can help to unlock uh, private capital. And I imagine that some of those challenges are similar in other developing uh, regions of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that's right. Um, so so precious, we're going to uh, end with you. And um, I'm really excited because at Quartz we cover um, African innovation a great deal, and we um, we put together an, a list of innovators in Africa that's actually coming out tomorrow, and it's all women. And the um, the amazing thing thinking about it today is that almost everybody on that list is working with inclusion in one of these areas, and and they're doing um, amazing things. So I'm I'm curious to hear more from you, like thinking about this from a regional perspective. What are some of the challenges that are particular to South Africa and to Africa more generally, and and what are the opportunities there? Because I know there's there's been so much work on these these issues there. And then in particular, um, I'd love for you to talk about this question of of women and um, and equity when it comes to digital inclusion. That's a lot. Well, thank you, 
thank you thank you very much um i'll try and cover as much as i can but i think if i may start with the gender um, a, a, you know a, a question uh, we are very far from gender equality when it comes to accessing the digital economy um, and as things stand women will lose out on the fourth industrial revolution gains that are being made if uh, and, and that's purely for two reasons one is because most women uh, participate at uh, lower occupation bands than men. And also, uh, we know that these uh, bands are uh, you know, involved with repeatable tasks, which are most likely going to be replaced. And secondly, with women uh, being not well represented in leadership and senior management positions all over the continent, um, you know, that, that is a problem. Um, girls not uh, being more involved with in, in STEM subjects than boys uh, means that there will be less voice and agency in shaping and, uh, you know, the, the impact of uh, the technologies that come out uh, without the voice from uh, women and girls. So I think it is very, very important um, in this day and age to ensure that women are well represented uh, within uh, this digital inclusion um, discussions that we have. Uh, and what we are doing at the Mutsipe Foundation is we have started programs since dating back to 2017, we started a program called Girls in STEM, where we uh, teach girls from high schools already, expose them and their teachers. We're currently working in 64 schools where we expose young girls and their teachers to women who are already in the STEM fields and in the uh, STEM uh, careers. That we hope will encourage them to choose subjects that will ensure that they follow STEM career paths uh, in future, you know, uh, in, as engineers, scientists, and mathematicians. Um, I think uh, the inclusion of girls in STEM fields is very, very important, but all equally important is to for us to ensure that uh, post-doctoral studies, post-graduate studies, we have women represented in the STEM fields, as well as in research. Um, we, we need more women involved in research, and I'm happy to hear you saying that uh, you, you have a cohort of uh, you know, uh, women that are doing very great things, um, and, and I hope to hear about that announcement tomorrow. Now, um, moving on to the, the, the challenges. Um, I am with the University of Cape Town um, and um, very proud that uh, UCT online has also been represented in the uh, prize that was announced earlier today with the uh, uplink. Um, but as we went through the pandemic, we saw firsthand how students who, um, some of our students, we, we support students with bursaries in 27 universities throughout South Africa. And most of our students come from poor homes. So when we were able to offer them laptops so they could work at home, offer them data so they could access lectures and be able to, 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 to present their assignments on, uh, on time, the, the, the challenge was that they were now not in contact with teachers and their colleagues, uh, you know, they missed that ecosystem. So uh, I like the point that was made that uh, digital is not going to solve all our problems. We should not forget the psychosocial dynamic, uh, you know, particularly for students that come from uh, poorer communities. Um, and I'm very excited about the Edison Alliance because I, I believe we will be able as a collective uh, to, to solve challenges that um, people from poorer communities uh, face. For me, one of the big issues is also uh, price support uh, for particularly youth, uh, price support for mobile data, particularly for youth uh, and uh, marginalized communities. Um, affordable data compact, I guess, I don't know, but uh, it, it would be fantastic to hear from from Hans, what the big companies are doing around a, um, you know, coming up with a compact of affordable data uh, that would be made uh, available for these uh, poor communities as, as well as youth. Uh, because right now, what separates the poor and the wealthy uh, in digital inclusion remains that um, the price, the price point. Um, Hans, that, that's an interesting question. Um, do you, do you want to take that one on? 
Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the, uh, you need to go to the use cases. I mean, I'm just going to give you one quote. I mean, the ITU, the, uh, and the Broadband Commission just came out with a annual report of, of, of digitalization. And the interesting fact, and I think that is telling, is that 3.8 billion uh, people are not connected, but 85% of them have broadband coverage. Uh, so it, it's more about the affordability and having use cases or, or application that is usable. I mean, we all uh, love to have streaming services and uh, look at TV, but here we're talking about essential services for citizens in every country in the world. And that's why we're precious is saying we, we need to see that we co-develop applications for healthcare, education, financial inclusions, and seeing that we have price plans that follow that. In, uh, and services and uh, accessibility uh, of, of, a, of technology that is supporting that. The only way to do that in a good way is actually uh, mobility broadband because of the scales of it and cloud services. The only way to bring it efficiency to you. So I think I agree with what uh, Jaffar said as all of that. The, the means is, of course, the application and the usage, but the foundation has to be there, and the foundation is actually the mobility broadband and the cloud, which I claim is a 21st century infrastructure because we will not have brick and mortar as we had for every citizen in the world in order to capture everyone to have the potential. So I see actually a collaboration with governments very much when it comes to those price plans. Uh, and we see, I mean, the Edison Alliance has already started sharing a couple of important things. One is that we see... Uh, uh, subsidies of broadband services to low-income families in countries like in the U.S., but in many other countries as well. Uh, as important as we know, food is always number one. There's no discussion about that. But, you know, suddenly with the digital inclusion, actually being able to access it is a high necessity to be part of our society. The other thing that we, we have launched in the Edison Alliance, which I'm, I'm proud to be part of as well, is that uh, is, is uh, uh, the financing of digital inclusion. We see bonds coming out in the market where you can use your leverage as a global corporation. I mean, Ruth and I would know it because we're borrowing a lot of money uh, and we can actually uh, put money towards green bonds, digital inclusion bonds uh, today because those tools did not exist, exist before. They're equally good as any other bond, but we can dedicate money to it and we have financiers that are coming in. And we just released uh, uh, from the Edison Alliance uh, the playbook for doing that. And there's a lot of companies starting doing both green bonds, but also digital inclusive bonds. So that means that the money that we spend is actually invested for getting digital inclusion. So there are new ways, uh, but I agree with Precious that we need to find the right models for the right type of, of citizens so they get the services. And that's what we want, we want in the Edison Alliance. We want to share that. We want to share what Ruth is talking about uh, when it comes to inclusion and education and getting better jobs by being included. That's what is important for us. So Ruth, there's actually a question from the audience about ESG bonds um, and how those relate to Google's goals for the next billion users. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I'm delighted to. I'm building right off of Hansa's comments. So last year, we issued a $10 billion bond of which $5.75 billion was um, designated to support sustainability efforts. Five of those were around climate change. Three of them were around social issues, affordable housing, racial equity, and COVID-related small business support. And the reason I wanted to issue this as a sustainability bond really hit on a number of the things that we were talking about. My view was that it was important to put out publicly what we were doing, and then you're held accountable to report on that on a regular basis. It opens up and supports the creation of this very important new asset class. There's obviously no silver bullet to solve the problems that we have in front of us. We have to bring a lot of different elements together. Investors want to participate in it. There isn't enough product in which to invest. So it's a really smart opportunity for corporate issuers, for, for government issuers, a sustainability bond is a way to access new capital and enable others to invest in the initiatives that you delineate. It has to be done in a high quality way. I think listing what is it that you're doing, the accountability, the auditing of it is all important to really protect the, the quality of these um, investments and commitments, but I'm really excited about it. And it is an open market and one that's evolved from 
green bonds, which are important in and of themselves to this broader set of social issues under the umbrella called sustainability bonds. So there's a, a question about um, about um, rural connectivity, which I'm interested in, and and um, I'm not sure which. I think all of you would have really interesting perspectives on this. So please please let me know if you want to answer this. But um, but the 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 question is specifically about um, how to finance global rural connectivity to tap all of this potential. Um, but I'm also curious about what the particular challenges are there. I mean, we've talked about different contexts, but what are the challenges that are that are in rural areas now and how are they different in the in the past and, and what needs to be done from a finance perspective, but but also just in terms of, of business models and partnerships in order to actually deal with those challenges this time. Does anyone anyone want to jump in on that? Um, I, I can just mention one thing that I think uh, you're facing when you're rolling out network. That is the power grid is actually not equally uh, dis distributed as the technology grid when it comes to uh, uh, mobility, broadband. That is far gr greater the grid than the power. And of course, that is posing a challenge, especially in the rural areas, because that means that uh, uh, you, you need to use generators or diesel or whatever, which is not good, you know. So I think that's one of the challenges because it's become not only uh, uh, good for environment, but it's also not sustainable over time to do that. So I think uh, the power grid is one because then you need to charge your phone. So whatever device you have as well. So that's things that you need to fight in the rural areas uh, across the globe and improve. And, and of course, with a sort of green uh, energy coming in, we need to have more and more of that to see that the rural uh, communities can get uh, green energy. And that's what Ruth talked about when it comes to doing green bonds or sustainable bonds. The ones that can do it uh, and have the means like uh, Ruth and Google, and I would say Verizon, we have also done our green bonds very clear. The money needs to go to, uh, we are accountable for it. Uh, so I think that's a way to do it and use the responsibility that large corporations have in this area. But that's a challenge in the rural areas to get uh, this out. And then, of course, devices is still too expensive uh, in many cases uh, that we need to work with that. And that if it's a pad or a phone or uh, whatever, the device that you communicate is still too expensive, even though we're driving down the price dramatically as we use the same technology regardless of where you are in the world. That's why we're, we have so many people that are connected today, but we still have a way to go. Butter, from a from a, a finance perspective, um, how do you think about this question of rural connectivity? Well, just a point I'd like to make about the uh, business dimension uh, overall. While digital inclusion is, uh, I think, more often than not spoken about at the human level, uh, I think it's important to consider that it also exists at the at the business level, right? In, in many ways, the dynamics of both digital divides mirror one another. Uh, as we know, there is a significant gap between the digital capabilities of SMEs uh, and, and large enterprises or digitally native uh, tech startups. Uh, and this is prevalent globally, but more so in emerging markets and rural areas uh, like, like the MENA region, where, as we know, SMEs account for over 90% of all businesses and are a major uh, source of desperately needed job creation and economic growth. The digital gap uh, between businesses has also widened during the, the pandemic, especially in areas where I think critical mass matters for cost uh, effectiveness, things like um, enterprise uh, resource uh, planning uh, and, and supply chain or customer uh, relationship management. Uh, and there's also an internal skills gap that I think prevents businesses from identifying and implementing digital solutions that are increasingly required uh, to compete. Larger businesses, I think, as well as governments, have a role to play here, um, including through the uh, creation of upskilling uh, incentives uh, and, and networks. Ultimately, of course, the answer lies beyond uh, digital connectivity of, of SMEs. Again, digital technology must be seen as a tool uh, to enable and empower small businesses to scale their businesses and enhance their productivity, uh, creating uh, new jobs and uh, economic uh, opportunities. 
Uh, as a, uh, an Edison Alliance partner, we um, as Crescent Enterprises uh, are looking to work uh, to scale up uh, SME uh, digital capacity in the Middle East and North Africa region by encouraging digital training and upskilling uh, and also building a, a data culture uh, within SMEs across our own uh, supply chain uh, and enhancing their access to new uh, technologies uh, and knowledge networks. So the, the rural power grid challenge that Hans mentioned is a, is a good example of a place where there's a lot of on the ground innovation um, where that's happening. And, and we have a question from the audience about how the Edison Alliance is keeping track of the bottom up innovations that can really boost digital inclusion, but that are often hidden from larger institutions like the institutions that are leading some of this work. Um, so I wanted to start with you, Precious, and, and, and hear uh, your insight on how to make sure that the innovations that are happening sometimes in, in very small companies or, or, or um, very local situations are getting fed back um, so that, so that a, a very large collaboration like this can take advantage of them and scale them. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I've just been traveling on the continent uh, in the last eight months. I've traveled to 12 uh, African cities and I'm just amazed at the dynamism and energy of uh, young people on the continent. And we need to be tapping into this energy right now. So um, your question on how we then tap into that uh, innovation from these young people is very important. And I think that um, at this stage, institutions such as universities, um, uh, you know, as I said, uh, UCT Chancellor, are important points of collecting and working uh, and identifying these young people uh, and ensuring that um, uh, with their innovations and uh, protected, they're able to uh, be you know, accommodated and mainstreamed uh, into uh, bigger collaborations as we have in the Edison Alliance. At the moment, uh, as a foundation, we are in talks with uh, a, a, a company where we want to also provide rural Wi-Fi infra infrastructure for our communities. And what is important for us is to ensure that uh, ultimately the network ownership and maintenance of the infrastructure is with the communities themselves, uh, because that way we will be then uh, ensuring that uh, this is truly, truly inclusive. And lastly, I just wanna say that uh, uh, as part of uh, trying to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, digital finance particularly is accessible to women and young people, what uh, we have invested, uh, um, we've made a huge investment in a digital bank that is one of the fastest growing in the region with uh, uh, you know, more than 120,000 people signing up every month. And what I like about them is that they work with women, particularly women in rural communities, who educate young people, uh, marginalized people, about how to access banking facilities, uh, how to use the banking facilities, and they also ensure that when it comes to lending to these small businesses, they do not use particularly women-owned businesses. They do not only look at assets, but also look at uh, sales to ensure that they can borrow. And lastly, they look at disaggregate data to ensure that whatever solutions they provide will answer to the needs of uh, the particular economy. So um, sadly, we are so close to being out of time. Um, but so I have one final question. Um, and, and really, you know, this can come from any of you and please feel free to jump in. We have three minutes left. So um, I, I'd love to hear from as many of you as we have time for. But really, you know, stepping way back to, to try to sum this up, um, what do you think is the greatest challenge right now. And I'm thinking about this in the context of the pandemic. So that's obviously, you know, exposed a lot of this. It's, it's created um, clarity over the need. It's made a lot of things harder, but it's, it's an opportunity. It's made a lot of things possible that weren't possible before. So what is the biggest challenge and, and what's the biggest opportunity? What, how will we know other than, than being able to count off these 1 billion people, how will we know that this effort has really succeeded a year or two from now? 
Ruth, let's let's start with you and let's see how far we get. So I think you're absolutely right that the um, the opportunity is that what we've been through is so awful that if we don't come together now, when are we going to come together? And so this really is the time to have this call to arms. We've got to fix these issues. There was a recent study that came out that Stanford University, um, uh, Langone Hospital and Bath were involved in, and it said that something like three quarters of, of kids from 16 to 25 are terrified of the future. That's the future we've all built. It is our obligation to address it. So I think that's the greatest opportunity, which is we've got to mobilize. We have to build on one another. All of the comments that we've talked about here today, it really is the same group, underserved, underrepresented, that are constantly at the bottom on education, on jobs, on health, on every element. And so through a multiplicity of programs, digital skills training, health initiatives, education initiatives, climate change, it is only through all of that that we're going to solve this. And I think the most important is put aside our parochial, what's our program, come together and build on one another and drive to um, solutions and to your core of your question, and then hold ourselves accountable. How many lives are we actually improving? Where are we seeing the progress? And so that's what we're committed to do and look forward to working with others on this. And Hans, do you have a, a final thought for us on that? It, no, I couldn't agree more with what Ruth is saying. Um, and I, I think that what we have experienced the last uh, 18 months across the globe, you know, uh, is devastating to see. But it also have probably accelerated the leapfrog of technology use in five to seven years. Usually we can progress with technology, but now we have a, a, an even wider gap. And that also means we have a wider, wider gap for it to reaching the SDGs. So I think the urgency of working together and the Edison Alliance, exactly as Ruth said, is not about inventing a lot of new things. There will be that as well, but it's also building on the great things that many people are doing in corporations, public, private, and do it together in a better way. And, and I, I'm so encouraged what I've seen because every, there's no one that I asked that wouldn't say, hey, I want to be part of it. I can do whatever I can do in my capacity. I will do it. And that encouragement, I think, is driving me and many others in the Edison Alliance to, to take this forward. So uh, I'm encouraged and, of course, encouraged to listen to my uh, fellows here on this uh, panel uh, and the questions I was see that many people are really excited to help on this. And it's such an important thing. Well, thank you, all of you, for the work that you're doing and for being here with us today and, and telling us about it. And thank you to everyone who's here watching and listening. And um, of course, there are, there are many more fascinating and important panels for you to watch on TopLink. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day wherever you are. <laughs>